Today we conclude our sermon series, What's Mine is Yours. We began four weeks ago with Psalm 24, focusing on the foundational principle of biblical stewardship. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. But God's incredible grace and generosity says to us all, what's mine is yours. The next week, Lisa preached a powerful sermon on Psalm 139 through the lens of Runaway Bunny, one of my favorites. She focused on the gift of God's presence in every circumstance of our lives. And last week, we turned to Psalm 23 to consider the gift of God's providence in our lives, recognizing that when the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. Today, we turn to our response to this God who says to us, what's mine is yours, who is present with us in every circumstance of life, this God who provides for us every step of the way, leading us to green pastures and still waters, guiding us through life's darkest valleys, filling us with overflowing blessings. To consider our response, we turn to Psalm 145. This psalm represents the climactic conclusion of the fifth book of the Psalter. It inspired the final, it inspires the final four psalms that follow it. In Judaism, this psalm is known as Tehillah, meaning praise. It's reflected in our pew Bibles that label this psalm praise by David. As one commentator describes, to repeat Psalm 145 is to confess the insufficiency of self and the sovereignty of God. It is, in a real sense, to live in a different world, not in an escapist sense, but in the sense that God's claims, values, and priorities inevitably put us at odds with the prevailing culture that promotes autonomy. Psalm 145 invites us to live in the world of God's reign, the scholar concludes, the world where the fundamental reality and pervasive power is the gracious, compassionate, faithful love of God. How's that for an introduction to Psalm 145? Now let us turn to God's word to us from that remarkable psalm or begin at verse 10. Listen again for God's word to us this day. All your works shall give you thanks, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations." The Lord is faithful in all his words, gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living being. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of my Lord. And all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Now, Lord, grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. How do we respond when someone gives us a gift. Some might offer no response, but surely they are few and far between. 
Most of us will at least say thank you in, in some way. In this day and age, we might say it in a text or some other form of modern communication. We might take the time to write a note and send it in a thing called the mail, snail mail. We, we might even dare to say thank you to someone face to face. Wouldn't that be revolutionary? Better yet, our appreciation might be lived out in tangible ways. This month, our, our daily devotionals have been offered by congregation members as well as our pastors. We've read amazing stories of gifts given and received, how those gifts impacted people's lives, leaving us humbled by the generosity of others in our lives, and in many instances, committed to living more generously in response. Some devotions spoke of being stewards of the gifts entrusted to us, using them faithfully in our lives, making the most of opportunities given to us. Many spoke of ways they sought to give to others and of the amazing gifts they received in that process. Thank you to all who wrote devotions for this past month. It's been a real gift to receive them. One of those devotions was written by Dick Darlington. It was published on Friday, September 22nd, the day before he died from complications in the wake of open heart surgery. At Dick's memorial service held here yesterday, Averill Harkey quoted that devotional. Dick wrote, the world isn't split into those who give and those who need. We all have gifts to give and the need to receive. Consider the places in your life where you are much more comfortable being in the position of giver and open yourself to receiving from others. For when you do, he concludes, you receive the generosity and goodness of God. <laughs> what wonderful wisdom Dick offered us all on his final full day of life. In giving and in receiving, we come to know the generosity and goodness of God. <laughs> to receive that generosity and goodness, we must first recognize how generous and good God has been to us. At Monday night's session meeting this past week, Millie led us in worship we focused on the story of the Good Samaritan from Luke's Gospel. Millie helped us all see the many aspects of the parable that speak to stewardship. You remember the story. A younger brother and an older brother, they live on, I've always imagined, a farm with their incredibly, perhaps foolishly generous father. Barbara Brown Taylor calls the parable the parable of the enabling father. The little brother is incredibly entitled, so entitled that he demands his share of the family inheritance while his father is still alive. Can you imagine? With no sense of gratitude, he takes that gift and he blows it on a bender of biblical proportions. Entitlement. That's one way we can respond to God's gifts in our lives. We can live under the illusion that we deserve it. We're entitled to it and do with God's gifts whatever we wish. When it comes to our response to God, entitlement is an option, but according to the parable, it will eventually land you in the pigsty. The older brother offers us another possibility he is blind to the grace of his father. He lives under the illusion of meritocracy, that he's earned everything he has, and in fact, he hasn't gotten as much as he's earned. 
He doesn't think he's received anything, in fact, from his father. He's worked for every little scrap he's got. Remember his response when his younger brother returns home and the father throws a big party for him? He talks about how hard he's worked for so many years, working as a slave, as he puts it. I've played by all the rules, he proclaims. You've never given me anything, not even a goat to celebrate with my friends. The older brother believes he's done everything right. His younger brother has done everything wrong, and in the injustice of the father's grace to his brother, he is left bitter and resentful, refusing to join the party. That's another option to respond to God's amazing grace in our lives. Meritocracy. Deny it. Think we've earned it. We only get what we deserve. We only have what we've earned. This response blinds us to the goodness and grace of God, leaving us pouting outside the party, bitter, resentful, grumpy. Is that any way to go through life? You remember how the father responds to the older brother in the parable? It's so beautiful. Millie pointed it out, and I wish I had thought of it in time for today's sermon, because he quotes the title of our sermon series. The father says to the older brother, Son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. There it is. All that is mine is yours. Can the son recognize that reality? Can he embrace the grace of his father? Can he possibly rejoice in his brother who was lost and now is found? Or will he miss it all, the generosity of his father lost in his bitterness and resentfulness? Millie asked us a great question Monday night. She said, what do you think things were like at the breakfast table the next morning? Did the elder brother ever join the party? How did those two brothers respond to their father's generosity and grace? How do we? Do we live under the illusion of entitlement, squandering everything that's been entrusted to us? Do we live under the illusion of meritocracy, bitter about those who did not deserve what they got? Psalm 145 offers us another possibility. Psalm 145 invites us to join the party, to celebrate the amazing God who upholds those who are falling down, who raises up those bowed down by the weight of the world, who opens his hand to satisfy our needs, who says to us all, all that is mine is yours. The psalmist calls us to live with an attitude of gratitude. Writing all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. All your faithful shall bless you. We will tell of the glory of your beloved community. We will brag about your awesome power. We will tell everyone we know about your mighty deeds and your glorious vision for our world. We will live with an attitude of gratitude. Last week, I spoke about the gift of contentment a gift no amount of money could ever buy. Do you know the best way to discover contentment in your life? Be grateful. <laughs> Express your gratitude. A recent article in Positive Psychology put it this way, you can have all the money and achievements in the world, but if you are grateful for nothing, no matter what you make, no matter what you do, life simply will not get any better. 
It's like everything falls into the black hole of things we take for granted. We strive for more and more in our lives because we don't appreciate what we have. Gratitude is the secret to contentment. So we return to the question that began today's sermon. How do we express our gratitude to God? Well, it's Commitment Sunday, so the answer is obviously, turn in your pledge card. No. It's so much more than that. Today is also World Communion Sunday, the day that we recognize we are but one small part of the body of Christ in this world. We join that body around the table of our Lord. Today, we join Christians around the world hearing the words of institution spoken by our Lord. Do you remember them? This is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Do this, remembering me. What did Jesus mean when he said, do this, remembering me? It's so much more than simply calling us to gather at the table and celebrate this feast. This is, in fact, the way we respond to God's grace and generosity in our lives. This is Christ's call to us all. As he offered his life for us, so we offer ourselves in love to one another and to this world. As Christ offered his life for the world, we do this offer ourselves remembering him. Beloved, this is our faithful response to the God who in Christ has said to us all, all that is mine is yours. May we offer our praise, our thanksgiving, our gifts, ourselves, our very lives remembering him. Amen.